My message today is very simple, and I've titled it, Place It in the Hands of Jesus. Place it in the hands of Jesus. And you may ask, what should we place in the hands of Jesus? We'll find out very soon. Place it in the hands of Jesus. What do you do when you are in a difficult place in life? Time is not on your side. And you have very little resources, but a huge problem to solve. You look around you, and what you have is inadequate. And uh, these days, we are all aware of that. So today, we're going to follow Jesus and learn from him. We will examine the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It is the miracle, uh, the one miracle of Jesus that is mentioned in all the four Gospels. Each Gospel account gives a detail uh, that helps us to see the total picture. So ideally, it would be great to read all the four gospel accounts, but I am not going to be able to do that just for time, uh, for us to manage time well. I will focus on Matthew's rendering of, of that account and, and how uh, the apostle Matthew saw the account and the Holy Spirit enabled him to give to us. But I would also make references to Luke's account and John's account uh, in my message. Just before I read the passage, it's important to note that the miracles of Jesus Christ carry both a spiritual and a natural truth. At the base of it, the miracle is a supernatural, miraculous act. But it is also written for us to learn God's principles in it. And so whilst we see the supernatural miracle, we are also learning how God works and its application to our natural life. And so let's read the account from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 13 to 21, and this would form the base, but I, as I said, I will be accounting from the other Gospels as well. So Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 to 21. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he blessed them, broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. That means that although we normally call it the feeding of the 5,000, if you added uh, the women and the children, the number was way beyond uh, 5,000. The, if you want the other readings, it will be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 13 to 17, and John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 4 to 11. Jesus, as you know, was usually followed by large numbers of people. He was a phenomenal teacher of God's Word. Of course, he is the Word of God himself. 
And so anytime he taught people, had such clarity of the scriptures that they never had before. But in addition to teaching, Jesus also worked miracles in the lives of people and people were healed. So on this particular occasion, Jesus is teaching. Other accounts say that he's been doing it for three days. And, uh, and the Bible says that he has healed the sick. But this meeting is not taking place in a chapel. It's not in a church auditorium. It is out there in the field. And so for these number of days, people are listening to Jesus. The sick are getting healed, but the people are getting hungry because uh, they, they, they are human beings. They need food to eat. And so there is a challenge presented in this place. And Matthew says uh, in verse 15, uh, verse chapter 14, verse 15, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves bread. So what was the challenge facing them at this time? First, they had a problem with the place where they were. The Bible says they were in a deserted place. So they had a location problem. The people had followed Jesus to a place that is deserted. So the location is wrong. Many times we have a location problem where you pitch your tent, where you, you, you live, where you stay. For almost all of us in a nation like Ghana, there is a location problem because we are considered the least developed of the countries of the world, or at least our continent is uh, seen that way. And of the least developed in Africa, uh, we are probably the last but one. I think Central Africa is the worst and we, 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 we top them a little bit. So growing in a nation like Ghana sometimes seems like a disadvantage. The place is deserted. So that's, there is a location problem and, and we may feel there is a location problem. Maybe you think if you were in another country, uh, you were in another place, you would do better. So first, a location problem, place. Second, the time problem. They had a time problem. The disciple says the hour is already late. Time is against us. Time is against us. And the reason they say the hour is late is because this is evening and the sun is about to set. And you know those days there was no electricity. And so you couldn't switch on lights and there was no solar power uh, to give us artificial light. So when the light goes down, sun goes down, nobody works. So they have just a short time for something to happen because time is against us. So there is a location problem. There is a time problem. Time is against us. And if you look at it, they have a big need. A huge multitude. 5,000 men. Besides women and children. Hungry people. They've been fed spiritually. They've heard the word of God. Their bodies have been healed. But there is something about hunger that is not easy to compensate. When people are hungry, you can give them the word of God, uh, pray for them, but hunger has its own dynamic. And so these people, they appreciate the spiritual help they receive from Jesus. They appreciate all the good things. They appreciate the fact that they've been healed, but they don't appreciate the fact that they are hungry. And that's one of the things I've come to realize in life. No matter how well you help people, no matter how you try to help people, if they feel hungry, they tend to overlook all the good that has been done. So these people are hungry. And Jesus understands it. That although I have preached to them and I have ministered to them, they have a hunger problem. So there is a space problem. There is a time problem, and there is a huge need, a multitude. And the resources are limited. Five loaves of bread and two fish. I like how John's gospel renders that. John chapter 6, verse 8 
chapter 9 says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Five barley loaves and two small fish. And what are they amongst many? That's the resource they have. Matthew says it's five loaves, but John goes into a little detail and tells us the quality of the loaves. And he says there are five barley loaves. Now, why does John say it's five, five barley loaves? Because in the days of Jesus, top priority loaves were made from wheat. Just like our time here. Barley loaves was inferior, cheap quality loaves. So, so what they're saying is what we have is cheap, is barley loaves. And then we have fish, two fish. But he didn't say two fish. John qualifies the fish and says it's two small fish. In other words, the, the quality is inferior. The size is inferior. So you have barley loaves, not even wheat loaves. And you have fish that are small, not even tuna, big tuna uh, a fish, two small fish. And so they themselves look at the resource available to solve this problem and they ask a very simple question, what are they among so many? So they acknowledge what they have and they depreciate it. And many times we go through life that way. We look at what we have in our hands. It may not be barley loaves, but it may just be 50 cities. It may be five cities, it may be a hundred cities, uh, and, and it doesn't seem like much. What is this among so many? That's the question that they ask. What is what I have in relation to the problem I have to solve and the time frame that is against me and the location that is fighting against me? I came to announce to somebody today, God is about to work something in your life in your business, in the next few months, in this year, what you hold in your hand that seems inferior, what you hold in your hand that seems small, the place where you have that seems to be a disadvantage, the time that you think is against you, God is about to take all this together and put it into a package to work a miracle in your life. And as we bounce back from the hazards of this virus, we are going to be faced with limited resources, time against us, location disadvantage, barley loaves, two small fish. And we are going to ask ourselves, how can we use these for our nation, Ghana? How are we going to use the little resources and the disadvantages we have for you as a person, for churches, some of which have, are not even sure whether when we open, people will come back to church. So you look at the little you have. Maybe you are a little church in a small classroom. And you are wondering, how am I going to survive after this? God says, he's about to work something in your life. Yes, the location doesn't favor you. Time doesn't favor you. Resources are limited. They are cheap. They are inferior. And you're asking yourself, what are these? among so many. So they propose options. The disciples says, well, looking at where we are, the time that is against us, and the resources we, we, we have, send them away. In other words, don't even try to solve it, Jesus. Because Jesus asked them, what should we do? And the disciple says, sir, close shop, shut down the business, declare bankruptcy, send them away. There's no way we can solve this. Nothing is in our advantage. That's option number one. And if you have thought of that option, I want you to know God thought of you. And so he put it in the scripture that there will be people who have that option. But there is option number two. And that is the option that Jesus gave. Jesus says, give them something to eat. And they look at each other and say, Lord, do you really understand where we are? 
We are in the desert. The village, next village is far away. And even if we had so much money and we go to the village, we wouldn't even have enough bakers to bake enough bread for these people. And we are not even sure how much money is required to feed this multitude of people. But Jesus says, give them something to eat. God will give you something to eat. God will intervene in your situation. The location is wrong. The resources are limited. Time is against you. But I hear Jesus speaking from the centuries into our life today. Give him something to eat. Give her something to eat. Give them something to eat. God is about to give you something to eat. So, two options. Send them away. Don't try to solve it. Disciples. Jesus, give them something to eat. Now, if you were there, whose option would you be if you were in that multitude? Maybe some of them say, well, we think the disciples are smart. You know, they're practical people, so let's go. And some will say, well, we think Jesus knows how to solve problems like this, although we haven't seen him do anything like that. We think he can do something about it. Where would you be? Would you say, let me close shop or give them something to eat? I trust Jesus or I trust the disciples. Where is your faith? What is this among so many people? So, one of the disciples comes and says, Lord, there's a young boy here who hasn't eaten his food. He's kept his five loaves of bread and two fish. Remember, this is a small boy's lunch. It's not an adult lunch. So, I, in my mind's eye, I can imagine if he's a lad, probably about 12, 14 He's going to hear Jesus. His mother says, take this bread and take this fish. He didn't have anybody. He didn't have you know, big grown men in mind. So this is a small boy's meal. And they say, Jesus, this is what we have. Jesus is fine. Now let's try to solve the problem. So let's see how Jesus solves the problem. Luke's account in chapter 9 verse 14 to 15. For there was about 5,000 men. Then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. 5,000 people mussed up. It's very difficult to feed. When you see the problem big as it is, it's difficult to solve it. So Jesus introduced a process. He says to the disciples, there are over 5,000 people here. Let them sit down in groups of 50. So in groups of 50, that probably means if it's just 5,000, there'll be about 100 groups. So instead of solving 5,000 problems, Jesus now is looking at it in groups of Hundred or fifty for hundred. If even if you double it, there will probably be about two hundred groups spread out there. And what Jesus is teaching us is, even when you have all the solution, you have to organize the problem. You cannot deal with the masses as they are. You have to organize the masses. You have to organize the people. You have to put them in proper structured groups. Otherwise, your resources, no matter how miraculous they are, will be abused. Jesus knew the full number of the people. Jesus understood the size he had to deal with. So he rearranged the people. They came together as a mass, but he put them into an organized group. One of the things I've learned, and I'm sure you've also learned it in life, is that normally when you break down problems, they seem easier to solve. Normally, it's just, it's just, just break it down. Many times a problem looks so big, and then you break it down. As a matter of fact, in, in most mathematical 
uh, problems, the solution is just breaking it down. Breaking down the equation to the lowest level and you have the answer. So the ability to segment the problem. Jesus, the son of God, the creator of the universe, understood that when you are dealing with things that are natural and human, you have to organize it properly. So maybe your problem is huge, but if you segment it well, if you break it down well, if you put them in groups so that the problems don't walk from one group to the other, so that the problems don't interact with each other, but you solve one and solve the other and solve the other, probably it will make you see that although your resources are small, they can work in the large situation. So it's an important key. Maybe as you look at all the issues you have, you have to start segmenting them. What is a marriage problem? What is your children's problem? What is your business problem? What is a financial problem? What's a human resource problem? Which one is a, is a structure problem? Which, whatever it is, just break it down and see it clearer. And Jesus made everybody sit down. The days of Jesus were quite close to the days we live in in Ghana. If you don't make people sit down, they will trample over the food you are giving to them. We've seen it happen many times. Jesus made the people sit down. That just shows you how smart Jesus is. And so let's see how Jesus applied the resources. Matthew's account in chapter 14 verse 19. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he blessed, broke, gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. When Jesus was offered the five loaves, two fish, he took it. He took ownership of it. At that time, the five loaves was no longer the boy's five loaves. They were Jesus' five loaves. And this is the most important thing I want to bring to your attention today. Maybe what you have is small. And time is against you. And location doesn't favor you. But you have to learn to put it in the hands of Jesus. Somebody said, but pastor, how do I... Give it in the hands of Jesus. He's not here. Where do I find him to put my problems or my resources in his hands? You do it by prayer. And how do you do it? You totally surrender it to the Lord. And you trust in him absolutely. And you allow him to own it. In other words, once you say, Lord, I give it to you, you don't continue worrying about it. Yes, plan for it, but don't be worried as if you must solve the problem. Because the moment you do that, you haven't put it in God's hands. You haven't put it in Jesus' hands. When you put it in Jesus' hands, he is the owner. And you have to trust him. So somewhere in your life, somewhere in the next few days, you have to make a quality decision to take what you have in your hands and say, Lord, I don't even know how big this is. What is this among so many? But I place it in your hands. I trust you with it. And from today, I refuse to be anxious and I refuse to worry. Because it is in your hands. My five loaves and my two fish are not your five loaves and two fish. You have to give it to him. You have to give it to him. You have to trust him with it. And you have to do it in prayer. And when you do it in prayer, it has to be a commitment that is real. Don't put it in his hands and go and take it tomorrow morning. Put it in his hands and take it tomorrow morning. When you put it in his hands, learn to trust him. And say that in prayer. Commit it to him in prayer. So, Jesus took ownership of it because it was given to him. Then he blessed it. He blessed it. It was small, but he blessed it. 
to the word blessing means to celebrate it. It means to speak well of it. It means to set it apart. It means to invest it with far more. And then he broke it. So there is something you have. There is something I have. If you are a pastor, it may be diminished congregation. If you are a businessman, diminished business, goods and services, or resources, or capital. Probably these months of staying at home, you've just consumed your capital. Your working capital is gone. And you have just something little left. And you're not sure, can I start my business all over again? Can I start church all over again? Can I start my school all over again? Can I start whatever you're doing? Can I start it all over again? How am I going to make it again? How am I going to recover what I've lost? But this is all you have. It's not your fault that this is all you have. This is all you have because you are in a deserted place. Time is against you, but God left you something in your hand. What if there was no boy with five loaves of bread and two fish? But thank God there was one person who had not eaten his lunch. For three days he's been holding his lunch. Others had eaten theirs, but this boy had not eaten his. So look into your hands. There is something that has not been eaten. There's something that has not gone. There's something that has not left. It may be a building. It may be a land. It may be some money. It may be a relationship. It may be a contact. Whatever it is, it was not eaten. It's still in your hands. And you have to trust God with it. It's a radical faith. It's radical faith. It's not wishy-washy faith. It is totally abandoning yourself on the Lord. I say, Lord, this is all I have. I place it in your hands. Jesus Christ himself says, except a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But when it falls to the ground and it dies, it will germinate and it will bear much fruit. When you put it in his hands, it is died from you, but alive in his hands. And he will cause it to germinate. Now I want you to just look at the resource, the five loaves of bread. In the hands of the boy, it was just five barley loaves and two fish. Very limited and inferior. In your hands is limited and inferior. In the hands of the boy, it's in limited and inferior. In the hands of Jesus, it is celebrated. It is not despised. Jesus blessed it. And the Lord will bless what you give to him. Then Jesus didn't keep it in his hands. He lifted up into the father's hands. In the hands of the father, it transformed from inferior, limited, to expensive unlimited. Then Jesus took it back and he released it in the disciples' hands. In the disciples' hands, it was multiplied. And in the hands of the people, it satisfied. Many times I've pictured what this miracle looked like. The reason why it's the only miracle that is narrated by all the four Gospels is because so many people were there. Thousands of people, they saw it, and I can imagine the people who went out talking about it. Do you know what happened today? We were in the wilderness, and Jesus had only five loaves of bread and two fish, and look, he fed all of us. Thousands of people reported that. It was a miracle that could not be avoided. Most of the miracles of Jesus happened to one person, one person at a time, one blind person, one lame person, one mute person, or a small family. But this was thousands, all not spectating, but benefiting from the miracle. In the hands of Jesus, it changed. So I've always wondered, how could it be? So what this is what my mind, in my mind, I picture. 
Jesus, the boy has five loaves of bread, two fish. Jesus takes it. It's still five loaves of bread, two fish. He lifts it to God and prays. It's still five loaves of bread, two fish. He brings it down. It's five loaves of bread, two fish. Nothing has changed. If you're looking at it, you would say, well, no miracle has happened. But he gives it to the, his disciples, and that is when the multiplication starts. So he gives it to Peter. Peter, take this bread and distribute here. And Peter goes, he breaks a part of bread, and the bread fills up. He breaks, and it fills up. He breaks. Andrew is breaking, and it's filling up. It's breaking, and it's filling up. So you never see the miracle until it leaves Jesus' hands, and you start applying it. You start using it. That is when the multiplication takes place. The you're not going to end up with one day you look at yourself and say, Oh, look at it. I have a thousand loaves. No. It is when you use those 50 cities, that 100 cities, that little thing you have, that God starts the multiplication process. So after you have committed it to him, you've arranged the people. Use what you have. The multiplication starts when you use what you have committed to the Lord. And so they continue going, continues going. 5,000 people have fed. And these are men who are hungry. Some of them hungry for three, three days. I'm sure they went for second helping and third helping. And they ate more fish. And more bread. And when they saw more was coming, they were eating the more. And I, knowing how this society was, I'm sure everybody had belly full. Now when they couldn't leave, eat any longer, they dropped what they had in their hands. And there were an overflow. Twelve baskets. Huge baskets of what was not eating. Wow. Can he do that today? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm speaking to us on all levels. For us as a nation, the little we have, we have to restart. We have to organize well. We have to trust God with it. And it will feed the people. We can have restoration. For big industries, I've heard companies go bankrupt. That is heartbreaking. Sometimes I wish those people knew the Lord and trusted him a little bit more. But their balance sheet was their faith and they shut down. But there are companies that have been reduced to almost nothing who are about to bounce back. For families, you've eaten all your savings, but there's something left. God will use it. For individuals, God will use it. For small time businessmen, you operate a kiosk, or you carry your business on your head, or you have a tabletop, and everything seems to have been gone. But if you trust Him, not just a religious trust, but a radical faith trust that you can trust that God will take the little you have and multiply it. If there is any time we have trusted God, this is the time. If there's been any time when we say, Lord, either you or I die, this is the time. And you will not die. You will not die. You will not die in this wilderness. Although time is against you, God will come through with a miracle, a transformation. And so for all these people, they were all fed before the sun went down. Isn't that amazing? Within probably an hour, because if this happened probably around 4.30, Sun goes down, maybe 5.30 or 6. Within that time, that miracle had taken place. Everybody is fed 
and everybody goes home. Jesus sends them home with a testimony so radical that all four Gospels announced it. I believe God is going to give you a testimony so radical that the world will hear of you. And the world will hear of the people who had so little and yet trusted this big God. And he came through for them. Maybe you say, Pastor, are you really sure? My only assurance is in God. I have no capacity to change your life. But God has more than enough to take the little you have and transform it. I am not preaching myself. I'm introducing you to Jehovah Jireh, the God who supplies, the God who is more than enough. And if you trust him, he will not put you to shame. If you depend on him, he would take what you have and multiply it. So today I came here with a very simple message to you. Place it in the hands of Jesus. That's all. It's small. Place it in the hands of Jesus. You are in a deserted place. Place it in the hands of of Jesus. Time is against you. Place it in the hands of Jesus. What you have is inferior. Place it in the hands of Jesus. It is too small. Place it in the hands of Jesus. What is this among so many? Place it in the hands of Jesus. So we're going to pray this morning. And I want you to pray a prayer of surrender. Look into your hands, literally. And imagine all that you have. Your bank account. Most of us can remember the figure to the Peswa because we check it daily. And it's not good. So you remember your bank account. You, rem you know what's in your business. You know what you have. I want you to stretch your hands to God wherever you are. And imagine what you have, and say, Lord, this is all I have. Lord, this is all I have. This is all I have. And give it to him and say, Lord, from today I trust you that you take this and use it in this hard place, in this time of se and season of COVID, when even mightier businesses are collapsing, that you will cause me to experience your supply in a deserted place. Let's begin to talk to God. Just pray. Pray and talk to the Lord. We trust you, Lord. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We have very little, but we trust you. It doesn't seem like it can do the job, but we trust you. It doesn't seem like it can help us but we trust you. Time is against us, but we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. Just talk to him from your heart. Because he hears you. He is your God. Oh, Lord. So our Heavenly Father, our great God, Jehovah, you who created all things out of nothing, when there was nothing you were, and out of nothing you made the universe come into existence. You sustain all things by the word of your power. You who formed us in our mother's womb when we were nothing but a tiny dot and brought us this far. You who helped us in the beginning to build what we had. Today we take the little we have in our hands and we put it in your hands. For every mother, for every father, for every widow, for every widower, for every deprived person, for businesses that have been hit so hard, 
we place all that we have in your hands. And we say that from today, we trust you with it. We refuse to worry. We refuse to be disturbed. We walk by faith and not by sight. And we trust you that before the sun goes down, before this year is over, you would cause the little that we have put in your hands to become the source to touch multitudes of people. Glorify your name in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you truly trusted God, don't go back and take it from his hand. It's done. It's finished. It's settled. Just trust the Lord. And he will show himself in the wilderness of your life. Amen.